Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. I am super excited to have you on, as well as my expert that I brought on today. Now, today, I have a gentleman who has many streams of income, passive as well as a little bit of working, but at the same time, he doesn't have that J-O-B, that just overbroke job. He makes money in different ways. I have Doc G. Doc, thank you so much for being here on the show. Dustin, it's awesome to be here with you. You were just a guest on my show, Earn and Invest, so I'm excited to go the other direction and have you interview me. Yeah, the Earn and Invest show is a really, really good show. So for everybody listening, Earn and Invest is a great podcast. And I was on there talking about homeschooling. I love homeschooling. Actually, my wife, she has the hard job of doing homeschooling. I have the easy job of making money. So let's talk about more about with you. How do you make money to provide for your family without working that nine to five J-O-B that just overbroke job? So first I'd start by saying that it wasn't always this way. I actually had the just overbroke job for a lot of my young adulthood. I didn't look at it that way because I am a physician and my dream as a child was to become a doctor. So all my life, I was dedicated to this one idea of you will be a doctor. I didn't actually even think about money and I didn't worry about the specifics of a job. That's of course the childhood eyes. Now, as I became an adult and realized that being a physician had parts that I really enjoyed, but also wasn't exactly everything I had built it up to be, that's when that job became the J-O-B just over broke. And it was back in 2014 I was getting burned out by medicine and I was writing a medical blog at that time. And some guy called me up and said, I have this new book I've wrote about medicine and finances. Will you review it for your blog for me? And the book was called The White Coat Investor, a guy named Jim Dolly. And he sent me his book and I read it and everything clicked. I, I literally read it in three hours and I discovered that I probably was already financially independent, which meant that I already had enough money in the bank, enough assets to support myself. And that changed my life. It gave me a vocabulary for a lot of things I already knew. I was lucky. I grew up in a pretty financially savvy family, but it gave me the words to understand what my finances meant. And starting in 2014, it took me a number of years to escape that J-O-B because my identity was so tied to being a physician. I had all the pieces in place, but I wasn't emotionally ready to take the jump. And then I eventually did. I remember that I worked another two years after I, see, I invest in real estate rental properties and I had 30 some properties and I worked an extra two years because I was so nervous about leaving that W-2 job. Everything that I built for, what, 10, 15, 20 years, building up a career and all that sort of stuff. But then something clicked in my head. I realized even though I was making like $75,000 a year at my job, my just overbroke job, I was making more money from my businesses. And even though I was making $75,000, I was losing money working there. So I said, I got to get out. So now what are the streams of income? Can you walk through or list out the different types of streams of income that you currently have? So let me start by telling you what it used to be, right? When I first started my career, my stream of income was being a physician. So the first thing I did was I tried to maximize my ability to do that job. So I built a large practice and built in efficiencies to how am I going to do my job, do a great job at it, but still see enough patients to build in these huge streams of income. So the first thing is to actually work on your main gig, which is what I did. Eventually, however, I built that out into some other streams of revenue. And there were the what I like to call the lazy side hustles. Those are the side hustles that actually had to do with my job. So I was trained as an internal medicine physician. So it was really easy to start doing medical legal consulting work. So in our malpractice system, Whenever a doctor is being sued, you need other physicians who act as experts, both on the plaintiff and defense side, to talk about what happened. And this was a natural extension of what I was doing already because I was already an expert by practicing medicine. So one of the first income streams I had is I started doing medical legal work. And then while I was practicing, one of the nursing homes in the area said, hey, we really need a medical director. Why don't you come here? We'll send you patients, which again was increasing my bottom line because I was building my practice. 
but they also paid me an administrative fee to sit in on some of their meetings, et cetera. So my next form of lazy side hustle was working as a medical director for a nursing home in the area. And what happened is I started building these little lazy side hustles. I call them lazy not because I wasn't working, but because I didn't need to get any new skills. I already had them. So by practicing general internal medicine, I was taking care of a lot of elderly people who were in the process of dealing with chronic disease or dying. So it was very natural for me to start working with hospice because a lot of my patients were going through that. So again, I didn't have to pick up a huge number of skills to then eventually start working as a medical director in the hospice. Now, those were my lazy side hustles. I also had side hustles that had nothing to do with medicine. So I had started writing a medical blog and someone had approached me and asked me to write for their medical site. So I used to be a paid blogger. Um, I also come from a family who is involved in real estate. So my wife's parents owned a few buildings. My parents owned up to 13 or 14 units when I was a kid. So my wife and I fairly quickly got into real estate. Interestingly enough, we bought our first property. It was a condo in downtown Chicago. We live in the suburbs and we bought it to use it on the weekends. So we would go there, spend the weekends. It was a one bedroom in a high rise. It was about a thousand square feet. We renovated it into a two bedroom, turning the dining room into a second bedroom. We used it for about six months, realized we weren't using it enough. And our realtor said, hey, I got a friend who's getting divorced. He could really use a place. We ended up renting it out to this guy for two years. It was so easy that when he decided to leave, we put it up on the market for rental. And that thing has been rented for the last 10 years. This was right about when the real estate downturn occurred. And we had a lot of luck in the condos because the condo was simple for us to manage, right? There just wasn't as much to take care of. It was tiny. It was in a building that had their own repair person. So as the market went down, we bought a foreclosure, which was another condo in a really hot area that we knew would always be very rentable. And we bought that for you know, probably half what it would have gone for a few years before. We did some minimal renovations, rented that one out. And the next thing you know, we ended up with four properties. And so we have passive income coming in from those four properties. And then last but not least, I do get some income from the podcast and from blogging. So when you put that all together, there are multiple streams of income. And then there's that other part, which is in the process of building wealth through being a physician, I invested heavily in my 401k as well as in a taxable account. So I consider my dividend income as passive income streams too, because every three months I get a little bolus of money that comes into my accounts. If I don't need it, it goes right back into more investments. But especially if I decide that I want to work less or not work at all, because as you mentioned, I still have a little bit of a job. I've really pared it down to almost nothing. But if I decide I want to let go of that totally, I'll still have income streams between the rental real estate and the dividends. Um, that'll help tide me over. That's great. And having multiple streams of income or multiple ways that money comes into your pocket is really, it helps in many different ways, not just because you are having um, more ways to not work and still make money, but like in a recession or if something happens to one of the businesses or one of the ways to make money, like God forbid you actually can't do any more work for a company or anything like that. You still have your real estate. You have so many different great reasons to have multiple streams. Now, if we were to, I want, I want to touch a little bit on two different things. Cause you talked about your, your podcast, your real estate, as well as your business where you're actually doing, uh, you're, you're being a doctor and you're still doing that work. Let's touch on the real estate first. And then I want to do want to touch on how you're doing being a doctor, but not necessarily doing doctoring doctor type work. You close down your practice, all that sort of stuff. So let's talk about real estate. Now, when you first started, you actually bought it to have, is it like a vacation uh, home in Chicago so you can go visit? Is that what it originally was? So the upper crusty way of saying that is a pet -a -terre, right? So it is a city place for people who live in the suburbs. So we bought this thousand square foot condo in a high rise. It had a pool on the top of the building. It was right in the middle of pristine, beautiful downtown Chicago. So at first we were going to use it really as a city place to use on the weekends. And we quickly realized that we the idea of it was a lot more fun than the reality. And 
I, I, I do want to hear that word one more time because I've literally never heard that word. What's that word again? Pedater. It's um, <laughs> it's like feet on the ground. I think if you, it's Latin or French, but okay. uh, basically this this is it's a common name or uh, refrain for a for a city place or like a little condo or home you have in the city. Got it. Okay. Pedater. So with that, you realize you don't really use it all that much. And one thought that I had when I first started investing in real estate, I always thought, you know what? I should buy places like in Hawaii or in the mountains by ski slopes, or I should buy certain places that I can go visit. I would rent it out the most of the year, then I could go visit whenever I want. And then as I got older, I just realized that's not really necessary. I'm totally fine with paying I don't know, $1,000 to go stay at a week in Hawaii for a place and just pay that and not have to worry about that. All the properties that I currently own, I literally don't visit, I don't see, and I make so much money. It's just, it's, that, that was easily taken out of my brain after I realized, you know what? I probably won't go to the same place every single year. I love, the, the world is amazing. There's so many different countries that are, well, actually, literally every single country is amazing. I'd like to see all of them. At least that's that'd be the goal. And so if I had, was locked down to some, one place, it wasn't going to be the best. Okay, so now that you have one property and you ha- it was great, it turned into a long-term tenant. It's been rented for 10 years, which is amazing. Uh, so you then jumped into another one when there was a downturn. Did you see that coming or was it just, oh, was, oh my goodness, these things are like half off. Let's start buying them. My wife and I had always looked at real estate. So we're the kind of people who will go and go to like 100 showings a year and maybe buy one. So... We were used to going and seeing a lot of real estate. My wife in particular was always looking at the real estate market. And when the housing bubble burst, there were just a lot of foreclosures. And so our thought process is you've got all these foreclosures. This has got to be a good time to buy. And we really, you know, it's about the confidence. When most people go into their first real estate investment property, the biggest problem is mindset. You just can't figure out, okay, how's this going to work? How am I going to go from buying it to renting it to making money to managing it? Once you get past doing that once, it becomes very obvious to you that to go from one property to two properties to five to 10 probably is not that difficult. So when we bought the first and ended up making it into a rental and it worked so easily. We knew especially condos. So a lot of people say don't invest in condos. And I'll tell you, condos are not usually what you first think about investing in. In our market in Chicago, it happened to be fairly cost effective and easy. So you do have, you know, HOAs, you have assessments, those kind of things. So you do a little, you lose a little bit money there, but upkeep and maintenance is so low, you can still make a reasonable profit. And so when we saw that we could do the condos, not put much thought into it, and we were at this place in our lives where we had a decent amount of money in a taxable account, so we had securities already, my thought process was, how are you going to diversify further? And so for me, real estate made a lot of sense. We also bought our properties in cash, so we did not leverage. But again, this was a decision based on the fact that I had this job that was providing a lot of cash inflow and I already had securities tax deferred as well as taxed. How am I going to protect myself? This idea of buying some real estate and getting cash flow from it, it was worthwhile to have less of a return for me, but have some guaranteed cash flow as a diversification play. So we ended up with two properties. And then, of course, we did the same thing we did with the first. We decided that we wanted a lake house and bought a big house on Lake Michigan, fixed it up. And eventually, by the time we were done fixing it up, we didn't want to use it anymore and ended up renting (laughs) it out. So that was property three. That's great. And being somebody who does make a lot of money or has a lot of money coming in, it's not that you... Because I, in working with a lot of doctors or people that have a lot of money, as I teach people how to do real estate, I realize that they don't necessarily need, when I say need, I mean need that passive income. They need to have less taxable income. They need to have less money in their pocket that IRS, the government can take out. And so they, I just need to park my money here. It's going to store my money here. It's going to be there for the future. It's going to appreciate. I'm going to make money on all that sort of, you know, passive income, but they just need to be able to park money. So it's lowering that taxable value or not taxable, the the taxable account or a money that you have, you want to lower the amount of money that that big uncle Sam can take from you. So from there, if you're going to go into property number four, so you then rented property number three, the lake house, 
Is that long term or is that Airbnb? So we rented it long term and had a tenant there for three or four years. They decided to move out. And we had also bought that in foreclosure. We had put about forty or fifty thousand dollars into fixing it up. And so we decided to sell it because it had been three or four years and the real estate market had was booming comparatively. Yeah. And so we put it on the market without a realtor and with just a lawyer and ended up selling it to one of the neighbors who was looking to move up and they didn't have a realtor either. So it was, we had two lawyers. So obviously the fees were very low Mm -hmm. um, and made about a 70% profit on it. Right. So we bought it for X and, or we bought it, let's say for a hundred and we sold it for 170 type thing after three or four years of also collecting rent all those three or four years. And then we took all that money and did a 1031 exchange and bought two more condos. That's awesome. Now, when you said that most investors would shy away from condos, I absolutely do. I don't like condos whatsoever, but that's there, there are many instances where condos work out well. The reason why I go away from condos is because I can buy single family homes and get a good return from there and not have any other HOA fees or, you know, a wall next to you that you have to worry about things like that. But condos are still great there. As long as you have a piece of real estate that can actually make you money that's attached to the ground, because people would say, well, what about, uh, you know, it's not a condo. What what about a mobile home? And I say, well, a mobile home is a depreciating value, an asset. And it's not an asset. It's a liability because it keeps going down in value. It's not attached to the ground. So when you're looking at now you have properties, And I love the idea that you own them cash. Now, I personally love using leverage, utilizing mortgages or private money or anything like that. I love doing that. But at the same time, I also love all the properties that I own cash because I don't have a mortgage on those. And all that is literally cash coming into my pocket that would normally go to a mortgage. Talk to us a little about the idea of not utilizing leverage. And would you ever use leverage in the future to get more properties? So for us, it was a very thoughtful process in which we bought these properties. And so leverage just wasn't important to us. We knew that we could get out of the properties what we needed to without leveraging, which was A, a diversification play, B, a tax play, and C, a form almost of a dividend, but not by going back into stocks, which we were already pretty heavy in. So I look at the cash flow from my real estate as pretty much like a dividend, right? You get paid a certain amount of dividends. So it fulfilled all our needs and we didn't need to lever. I'm in this place right now. And this is always, I will tell you, this is always one of those things I have to toggle between because I can use money and leverage to make money or I can do my job, the bit of it I like, that bit of my job that I've kept around. I don't have to put any money in to risk it, and my returns are greater. And this, I guess, is the luck and benefit of having a specialized skill. So I continue to work as a hospice doctor, which is my specialized skill, and I can make more money doing that than just about anything. So again, what I need out of my real estate portfolio isn't huge returns, it's diversification. So for me, it provides instant easy cash flow. It is an appreciating asset. It's got a good tax profile. It helps me minimize the risk of all my paper investments. So it does all those things for me. So I don't imagine I'll lever much in the future just because I don't need to. You know, there's two ways to look at real estate and maybe to look at what I call financial independence, right? You can do it one of two different ways. If you do what I did, which is front load the sacrifice, I build a skill set, I used it to make lots of money, I then made that money. And now as I'm in my 40s, I let that money work for me. And I don't have to do much. That's front loading the sacrifice. A guy like me uses real estate for a whole different reason than a guy who's in his early 20s who looks to be financially independent, not by front loading the sacrifice and building a huge number of assets, but instead creating assets that cash flow that pay for their living. So if I was doing real estate for that reason, I would really look at leverage more. And so 
it has to do with kind of what you did with your life and how you looked at your finances to start with. Um, and I think both of them are incredibly valid ways to do this thing, right? So if you were in your 20s and you don't have a passion to go work as a doctor, engineer, lawyer, any of those things, and you're like, well, how am I going to make a living? Real estate is the by far best way to do it. There's no question about it. You can go from crushed by a job to financially free in a short period of time, be, being savvy and being it reason, you know, being willing to work and study. Real estate is the way to go, especially again, if you don't have a passion. But for me, I use it for something very different. Yeah. And what I love is as we have real estate and different options or different ways to invest in real estate and different reasons, even risk tolerances. Can we actually tolerate the risk of leverage? A lot of people do or don't. So I, in your story of the two different types, you know, you were the, the doctor that had income and then you don't need to use leverage. I was the opposite. I was, when I first started investing, I was making like $40,000 a year and I had like two or three kids and didn't have any money. And uh, we stripped or, uh, you know, just saved and, and just every single penny put to real estate. And I got lots of leverage. I'm blessed now after I built my business to pay off I, with all the 30 plus properties I have, I think I only have like maybe three or four mortgages on the other ones are all paid off. And like, it's because as I, as I got bigger and bigger, I was like, okay, I could pay this one off or okay. I can now pay this one off. And now I just, I, I, so there's, there's two different ways to do it. One with leverage, one without, as well as a middle way, you, you combination both, but it really depends on you. And that's what I love about real estate. There's so many different options, so many different ways to do that. You just need to learn how to do those ways. Okay. So now with real estate, you also have, I, I do want to hear about how you switched from being a doctor with a practice with uh, overhead of employees and all that sort of stuff, and even a physical location to where you're now, instead of that, you're now consulting. Talk to us a little bit about that. So my profession, I got into medicine because I was deeply interested in being a doctor, but I also had that eye towards efficiency. So what I always believe is when you work, wherever you work, from the moment you start a new job, your brain should be working on how can I do this better? How can I learn more? How can I make more money doing this? How can I have a better product? So I started working for a business. I didn't own my own practice when I started. That's because I didn't know how to own a, a practice. And so when I looked at how am I going to do this, I said, well, I think I need a few years working for someone else to figure it out. And so I went to work for this practice and there were five other doctors in this practice and it was part of a, a bigger hospital system, which has, let's say, 100 or 200 doctors doing similar to what I was doing. And I asked all those doctors and they said, this is a great place to work, but don't ever expect to make a bonus. It's impossible. Doctor after doctor after doctor said this. So I said, well, I'm here to learn. I'm eventually going to do my own private practice because I know I can make more money, have more control by doing that. But let me see. So I get into this job and within a year or two, I made a bonus. And by four or five years, I was making, you know, almost doubling my salary. So I learned pretty quickly that, A, when people tell you you can't do something, it's usually they can't. They can't. Exactly. Whether you can't or not really remains to be seen. And second... I use that time in that practice to really figure out, well, how do you run a medical practice? What makes money? What doesn't make money? What makes a good doctor? What makes a bad doctor? So after about five years, I started realizing that, well, I didn't start realizing, but it became very clear that if I saw double the number of patients that my partner saw, I might generate an extra $100,000, but I only got to keep $50,000 of that because the practice got the other $50,000. On the other hand, if I owned my own practice and I generate an extra $100,000, yeah, maybe 10000 of that will go to extra supplies because I saw all those extra patients, but then the other $90,000 stays with me. So it was a process of iteration. I went from working for someone else to working for myself, and I did that for a number of years, and I kept my eye on... Well, a few things really hit me. One is I was losing a lot of money in the office because having an office just cost a lot of money. You have employees, you have supplies, you have internet, you have computers, you have electricity, you have phone. That was one problem. The other problem was that I saw the politics of medicine changing. 
the way insurance companies were starting to control my time, the way Medicare was starting to control my time, the way doctors were having to see more and more patients to generate the same income. So again, my eye is always on the future. This isn't going to last forever. So I went from working for someone to working for myself. My income kept on stepping up, but my eye to the future said that this can only last so long. My biggest liability were those office costs. So eventually I started my own practice where I got rid of the office. I got rid of all the employees and I took myself with my stethoscope and a little bag of medical supplies and went to people's homes and charged them a premium for the non-insurance covered process of me going to see them in their homes. So again, the next iteration was I probably wasn't going to bill anymore above and beyond. I wasn't going to see any more patients. I got to the point where I was seeing 100, 150 patients a week. You don't want to see more than that. It's just, you know, it's not healthy for anyone. It's not good for your practice. Well, let's pause that because I, I do want to ask a question. How did you, in switching to that, how do you find those patients? We call, pay, basically call them customers or patients. But how do you find them? Because a lot of people, or majority of people are on insurance. Uh, so how do you find them as a doctor to if you want to do that yourself. So I covered that practice in two ways. One is by that point, my traditional practice had about 2000 patients. So I wrote a letter to all those 2000 patients and said, this is the option. If you'd like to stay with me, this is what it's going to cost you. That's great. If you don't want to stay with me, my partner is staying at this practice, stay with him. So about a hundred patients came with me. I didn't want too many. Cause remember I was driving to their homes. It wasn't the easiest setup. So 100 patients came with me, and I think at the time I was charging them $1,800 each. And then I also, because I had so much time left over, was working and seeing patients in the nursing homes, and I'd even become a medical director of some of the nursing homes, so I was getting a stipend to help run the nursing homes. But then I was seeing patients in the nursing homes, and I was able to balance those two populations. So I had my income coming from seeing the patients in their homes. And then I had income coming from the nursing homes. And remember how I mentioned that insurance and Medicare was starting to worry me? Well, I had also diversified my income streams because now money wasn't just coming in from the insurance companies, but people were paying me for a fee not associated with insurance to go see them in their home. Plus, I was making extra money doing things like being a medical director for a nursing home. So I kept on iterating, and that made me a lot of money when I did when you say, hold on, when you say iterating, what does that mean? Iterating. I kept on building and changing my model to get better and more efficient, right? So I went from probably my least ideal situation, which was working for someone else into practice to then working for myself, the, to then working for myself with much less overhead and money coming from other places besides the insurance companies. And that allowed me to bring in an income, which was probably four or five times what an average doctor would make doing what I was doing. And that allowed me to save a lot of money, invest, buy real estate, so that the point when I got burned out from all this, when I was exhausted and tired, I had the resources to look at my job and say, you're busy taking phone calls at three in the morning, working seven days a week, making lots of money, but that's no way to live long term. I did it for enough years to be successful and well off. I figured out my finances. So then I did the exact opposite. I said, is there anything worth saving in this job and get rid of everything else? So Seeing patients in their homes was awesome, but it was exhausting. And I get calls on Friday night and have to run out first thing Saturday morning and drive 45 minutes to get to someone's house. So the first thing I did was got rid of my home practice, which was great, except that the nursing homes were still calling me 20, day, 20 times a day. And there was a lot of sick patients there and there was a lot of back and forth. So eventually I got rid of the nursing homes. So what did that leave? In this case, I was doing some work as a medical director of a hospice and they needed more physician time. And that time was really relegated to Mondays through Fridays. I mostly had some meetings and everything else was by phone. And there was no nights, no weekends, no being on call. So my strong financial position allowed me to pull back from all those very high revenue generating activities and focus on what still brought me joy, the thing I really liked doing, which ended up being this hospice work. 
And interestingly enough, I did this about two years ago, but my net worth has continued to rise, even though my income is strikingly less than before, because I'm still collecting dividends from my securities. I'm still collecting cash flow from my real estate. And thankfully, I don't even have to live off my investments because the part of my job that I did like still creates a decent amount of revenue, much less than before, but certainly enough to take nice vacations and do things I like to do. What's what's great is you you worked hard. You've worked hard throughout this entire process. And as you work hard and you iterate, which means change and grow and adapt and get better, you're able to take on opportunities and remove things that are burdens to you or things that aren't the best that you're like, you know what? I could do without this if if I could. And you hit the nail on the head when you said you had the opportunity or even just the foresight to build up other businesses so that when you got to this point now and you were saying, I could, I want to remove this because it's it's a, a headache or it's a burden, or I don't want to drive on a Saturday morning for 45 minutes and be gone for from my family for like three hours for an appointment removing things because you've had you've worked hard you've built up your businesses your many different streams of income in order to make that make it so that your life is actually the way you want it to be as opposed to being dictated by your job your just over broke job having to be stuck where you are or not be able to have any i guess leeway to change anything to iterate to make things better so i love that now the whole process from beginning to end it takes many many years to get there but what i love about actually getting to the point where we are now is we actually have to say no to good opportunities they're really good opportunities we would have probably jumped on back when we were like you know 20 or early 30s we probably would have jumped all over those but now it's just like you know what i have so many other things that i'm going on that are going so well i've turned down so many opportunities just because i can now, getting there, it takes a lot of work. What's the future for you and your business? Because you, you're always looking at the future. What's the future for passive streams of income? Is there anything that we should be looking out for in the future? So I would always say, and this kind of goes along with what we were just saying, is you should continuously be looking at getting rid of friction in your life. And that's what we do, whether it's real estate or our jobs, is what is the source of friction? What's giving you problems? And how do you remove it? I am at this point in my journey with my finances that I'm really more into asset preservation and diversification. So I'm not as worried about building the assets. The beauty of front loading the sacrifice is that when you start the saving process in your 20s and early 30s, compounding takes off. So assuming a true black swan event, right? Something that is a once in a lifetime occurrence that wipes us out, all of us out. Assuming that doesn't happen, I've kind of diversified my skill set as well as my assets enough that I hope to work on risk modification, asset preservation, and then enjoy life, right? Do things I like to do. You're not going to make a living as a podcaster. At least 99% of us won't. But podcasting is something I enjoy and brings a lot of happiness to my life. So that's what I want to do. Do the things I want to do. Spend time with the people I want to spend time with. Go on family vacations. Um, grow and learn. And not worry about money. I mean, the end game is to worry as little about money as possible. I love the idea that... and. You front loaded all the pain, all the hard work, whereas now you still have hard work, you still have hard pain that you have, you have to go through like we, we all do. But we worked so hard in the beginning. Doc, you worked so hard in the beginning to get to where you are now. And it's having the, the foresight to say, I, I don't want instant gratification. I want to delay my gratification for the future. I did the exact same thing. Every penny as I was building my real estate investing business, every penny that I went, it went to something else was a penny that did not go to a rental property that made me more money to help me quit my job. So I sacrificed, I sacrificed and sacrificed and I worked hard and I worked hard, worked harder to get to where I am now. And now because I had that delayed gratification where I said, I'm gonna forego gratification on for the future. And if anybody does this, they see like Doc has, so you see the future, you see what you wanna do and where you want to be and how you want your life to be like. If you delay it off, 
it's going to come sooner rather than later. I didn't want to wait until I was 65 or 70 years old to eventually not work. I quit when I was 37 years old and it was the best day of my life walking out of the office last time. So from there, as you are thinking about wealth preservation, because I'm in that position now, what's great about real estate is not like a job, a job you cannot pass down to your kids. You literally cannot do that. There's no way ever you would ever be able to do that. But with real estate, you absolutely can literally pass that down to your kids, especially the knowledge on how to invest in real estate. I'll give you a quick little story. So literally yesterday, my oldest son, so I have four kids. My oldest son, his name is Elias. He comes in and says, hey, dad, so how much money do we all, all four, you know, his siblings, do we all have together? And I said, well, why are you asking that? Like he knows how much, he has like, I don't know, $800 or $900 in savings. He's only 10, but he has $900 because we make him save 50% of his money. He asked that question. I said, well, why? And it came out that he wanted to have all four of, the, all four of them pull all their money together and buy a rental property so they can make even more money. Because I show them, I put their money inside his savings account every month. We go and see, oh, 25 cents or 35 cents or something. They see that, but they're like, daddy, you make so much money on one rental property. I want to buy that. And so not just passing down the actual property, which is good, passing down the knowledge that we can to our kids, how we make money and how they can too. And that's when you talk about having a podcast, I literally don't make any money from successfully unemployed, but it's a passion of mine to show so many people that there are so many ways. I never thought I would have talked to a doctor that'd say, you know what? I don't, I just wanted to stop doing that. I want to do something else. And this is the way I did it. So this is fantastic. I'm learning a ton. So doc, man, you give us so much great stuff. I want to jump into the rapid fire round. Are you ready? Yep. All right. So the rapid fire round, broad questions. You should be able to nail them and don't feel like you have to rush them at all. It's not just because it's called rapid fire. doesn't mean you have to be fast. <laughs> so the first question is hopefully we have a little bit of extra time, not working that nine to five J O B or even maybe 80 hours a week for somebody else. Hopefully you have a little time to give either to our family, to our neighborhoods, or even make the world a better place. How are you helping the people around you to have a better life with your extra time? So I volunteer for our, my daughter's school. So my daughter was going to public school and she got bullied a lot. And at some point we decided to send her a private school and there's a wonderful private school in our area. And they were connected to a teaching university and the teaching university left. It was a hundred year old school and the teaching university left and they had some problem with their endowment. And my daughter goes there and gets so much benefit from being there. The teachers are wonderful. The curriculum is amazing. So I've been volunteering time to actually help them build a podcast to market their school. So we put together a podcast about the, they're a progressive school. So about the progressive education and what they do at their school. And so I've been spending a lot of time doing that, creating a podcast for them and trying to give back to this place that is really given to my daughter. I, as you know, when there's something going on with your kids and it isn't right and you see their distress, we saw my daughter go from a happy, excited kindergartner to an almost depressed down third grader. And eventually we realized that she was in a school that just didn't fit her. And so when we did move her, she came alive again within months. And so that really made me want to give to the school. So we give financially, but we also give our time. We also give financially to all sorts of other um, charities. We like to donate to doctors across borders. Uh, we donate to the ACLU. We donate all sorts of places. So try to give some of our time and some of our money. That's great. What is one bit of advice that you would give your younger self that your younger self would never have known, but you're older and wiser now? What's one bit of advice you would give? Probably a big piece of advice would be stop rushing around so much. I made lots of decisions, especially when I was younger, because they were fast. For instance, when I was in medical school, I went to Northwestern, which is a wonderful medical school, and they are connected to one of the best business schools in the country, Kellogg. And my medical school offered an MD MBA program. And for one extra year, I could have gotten my MBA from Kellogg. And my wife said to me, she said, 
you need to do this. And I'm like, I want to be a doctor. Who cares about this business stuff? And she said, no, you might not admit it to yourself, but you're actually interested in business. You have a business mind. You'd be amazed what having this degree could do for you. And I was in such a rush to get through medical school that I never took her suggestion seriously. And of course, I'm doing fine and my career ended up being great, et cetera. But it was a wonderful opportunity for one year of my life to get some extra awesome education. I pretty much was guaranteed to get in because I was going to medical school there already. Why not? Like, why was I in such a rush? I now realize that it's okay to slow down. You, It's not that you're deferring your dreams, but it's okay to slow down and develop other dreams alongside with them. And there's a, a quote, I have no clue who ever said it, but it's youth, or sorry, uh, uh, youth is wasted on the young. So basically, people who are young, and we were there, we just, we don't realize what we have when we're young. So your youth is wasted on you, but at the same time, as you get older, you get wiser and you realize these things and hopefully we can pass these down to our kids. So I love that idea because I was the same way. I was go, 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 go. And um, it's always funny and I love it. But it's also a little bit of a, a pride check when your wife says, you know what? Remember I told you back then like, you should have listened to me. Like, oh, yes, you're right. <laughs> Pretty much I should always have listened to her. If we get that right now, I would have been fine. That would be a great bit of advice. I know whenever my wife says to me, you know, what? we probably shouldn't do this or we should do this. I've learned over many mistakes that I need to listen to that. <laughs> so I take her advice and counsel is so huge in my life now. So from there. What is one tool, one, it could be a pad and paper, it could be an app, anything that you're using currently that we should look into using? So this is going to be an interesting one because I don't know if it's going to actually answer your question, but I think it's important anyway. I use my blog as a tool, okay? It's my tool. It's my accountability journal. I've found that every smart move I've made in life has usually come after I've written about it. So I think journaling is a tool. So I know you might have been looking for something techy or something like that. But believe it or not, I think journaling or blogging is a tool that's oh so important. And I make such better decisions when I take the time out to really write and think about things. No, that is perfect. That is exactly something that we need to hear. We need to hear what successful people like you are doing. And if that's something that helps, man, I and I completely agree as I write for my blog, writing updates or things that are going on, it also documents what has happened, which helps me to like look back. What did I screw up or what did it go well and stuff like that? Okay. What is one nonfiction book that you would suggest? Could be business, could be life that we should look into for us as people. Nonfiction book. So certainly uh, The Millionaire Next Door definitely changed my changed my life. I mean, just reading that clarified so much to me about finances. Another financial one, and this is more for physicians or high earners, would be The White Coat Investor. I think those two books radically changed my financial life. That's awesome. I've read, I know of The White Coat Investor and I've read The Millionaire Next Door. Great, great books. Okay, so wrapping it up, what is, if somebody wants to get passive streams of income like you, what is one bit of advice that you, you give us tons of it, but is there anything that stands out that we should grab onto and say, you know what, Doc said this, let's go ahead and do it. So I really am enamored by this idea of lazy side hustles or lazy passive income. So before you jump into trying to do something you've never done before and aren't good at, I mean, there are reasons to do that too, but look at what skill sets you have already. I was able to utilize my skill and knowledge as a physician. I already paid for that education, right? So I was able to use that knowledge to then develop side hustles that didn't really require me a lot of new learning. So they were easy in that sense. So I think if you're going to look at passive income or side hustles, you've got to look at what you have first. Now, again, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't develop new skills. It doesn't mean you can't go in a totally new direction, but especially if income is your goal, right? Not, not joy, not the game of, of creating money streams. But if income is really your goal, look at what you have first before you start looking at what new skills you need to acquire. I love that idea. I don't know if I would call it lazy because you're going to be still working hard, but I like the idea that you're compatible 
compatible or uh, comparable or utilizing the skill set that you already have. A lazy is a good way to do to term it because you're not working extra hard to figure it out. I love mm. that. That is brilliant. Okay, so Doc, you've given us so much great advice and and insights. Somebody's going to want to reach out to you. Everybody's going to say, you know, how do I listen to your podcast? How do I find you? How can they find you on the internet? The easiest way to find us is to go to earnandinvest.com. That is the episode page for our podcast, the Earn and Invest podcast. You'll also find me a lot on Facebook. We have the Earn and Invest group there uh, where you get people who are part of our community. We talk about finances. We talk a little bit about politics. We talk about the news stories of the day. It's a really good place to just interact with people. And we do get a huge amount of interaction, people who are really commenting and engaging on the different posts. So those are two really good, simple, easy ways to find me. Awesome. Doc. G, thank you so much for all the great wisdom and insight. I really appreciate you being on the show. Uh, it's been a blast. Thanks for having me.